Okay, cool. So let's get into the word today. So for the past two weeks, we've been talking about the names that Jesus was given at his birth. And so the first week, we talked about how he's Emmanuel, that's God with us. And uh, just a side note, because I was told that at least somebody asked about why I spelled Emmanuel with an I instead of an E. Um, So Emmanuel with an I is the Hebrew transliteration, and Emmanuel with an E is the Greek transliteration. They're exactly the same. Um, Just one's Hebrew, one's Greek, and the NIV uses the Hebrew transliteration. So that's why we did that. Um, It comes from the word Emmanuel in Hebrew. Imanu with us, El God, God with us is Imanu El. And then last week we talked about how he's the Messiah, the anointed one, that he was anointed at birth for a purpose, that he, that's what the Magi did, that's what the wise men, that's, that's part of their job, was they would travel around, and when a new king came into power, they would come and anoint that king. And Jesus was anointed to be the prophet the priest, and the king of kings. And so we're going to jump in. We're going to read Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 23. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, it's before they got married, she, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. I just think that's funny. If you think about, he's like thinking about, you ever thought about doing something, and then the Lord just like shows up and is like, you're not going to do the thing that you want to do. But like, angel of the Lord like shows up in your bedroom and is like, I know you're thinking about divorcing your wife, but you're going to marry her. You're like, okay, I'll do whatever you say. That's just, that's where my mind goes when I read that. So the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Angel appears in your bedroom. I would be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Everyone said, yeah, right. All right, so the key in verse 21 is she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And this week, I did put the right title slide up. So the title of the message today is, And They Will Call Him Jesus. And They Will Call Him Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, Reveal Jesus to us today. Amen. Amen. So Jesus was given three names at birth. We've already covered Emmanuel and Messiah. And so today we're talking about the name Jesus. So I don't know if you know this or not, but his name's not really Jesus. There was was no one named Jesus in the Bible. So his name in Hebrew, the name he went by, the name he was known by was Yeshua. Yeshua comes from, it's a two-part word in Hebrew. The, the ye part, the, the ye ye part means God. It's where we, Yahweh, ye, that's God. And then Shua means salvation. So his name literally means God is salvation. So we've kind of subtitled the message today, Jesus, the God who saves. And in Hebrew, it's also not Jesus. Or in Greek, sorry, in Greek, it's also not Jesus. The the Greek word that would be closest to Yeshua, the meaning of Yeshua, is actually the word Hosanna. So the word Hosanna means save us, we pray. So it means God save us. That's what Hosanna means in, in Greek. And so in, it's, we don't have it on the slide, but in John 12, 13, the Bible says, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, they call it the triumphant processional, the triumphant entry, when he, when he entered into Jerusalem, 
they were shouting, God will save us. God is our salvation. And then he was riding out on a donkey, this little side note. Um, he, Mary never rode on a donkey to Bethlehem. Sorry. Um, it's not in the Bible. Um, but Jesus rode in on a donkey, and that was a symbol. Uh, the king would ride on a horse. And a king would ride on a horse into battle. And so when Jesus rode on a donkey, he was giving a message that I'm not, I'm not what you think I am. I've come to bring peace to the world, not war. And so Yeshua is, if you were to translate that from Hebrew, skip Greek, and go straight to English, Yeshua would, is actually the, the Hebrew name um, Ye- Yehoshea. And that translates to Joshua. And then Yeshua is kind of like Josh. So Yehoshea would be like Joshua, and then Yeshua is the shortened version, um, kind of like Josh in English. So it's kind of like how you get Buster from Thomas or something like that. So I saw this stupid <laughs> video on Facebook this week, and I, and I say stupid, um, and I mean that in the core of my being because it just irritates me. And this, this guy was on there, and he was talking about how the entire church is misguided, and we're all leading people to hell because we say the name Jesus instead of Yeshua. And he was very, very passionately wrong about this. And I just, just don't get legalistic about it. God can speak your language. Like, he speaks, he can speak every language. And I don't think it's some, like, masterful plan of the devil to get us to like transliterate Yeshua to Jesus and like now all of a sudden like we've lost all of our power. So like don't just just know. Okay, so Yeshua is the English word, the Hebrew word for the English name Joshua. And so Jesus his name is actually most closely derived from the name Joshua. Um, sometime I'll tell you about why they chose Jesus in, when they translated it, and it has a lot to do um, with removing the Hebrewness of Jesus from Jesus. Um, it's pretty anti-Semitic, really. But so his name is most closely related to Joshua, and there are two, there, there's four Joshuas in the Old Testament, but two of them are actually types of Christ. Meaning, they give us a picture, something about them gives us a picture of who Jesus is. It's a, it's a foreshadowing. that They foreshadow something that Jesus is going to do, or someone that he is, some part of his character. And so one of these Joshua's, we know there's a book called Joshua. He was Moses' successor he was kind of the, the captain, the leader of Israel that took Israel into the promised land. And the other Joshua that we're going to talk about today was the high priest when Israel returned from captivity. So Israel was in captivity in Babylon from somewhere around 600 to about 530 A.D., the dates, you can argue about them later, but they're 70 years from somewhere around 600 to somewhere around 530 AD, the Israelites were in captivity, and this other Joshua was the high priest when they returned to Israel from Babylonian captivity. And so we're going to look today at both of these Joshuas. I've got two points today, so not three, just two, one for each Joshua, and each is a foreshadowing of how Jesus saves us. So point number one is he saves us from the dominion of sin. Jesus saves us from the dominion of sin. So Moses sends 12 spies to go check out the promised land. I know you all know this story. And when he sends the spies into the land... In Numbers chapter 13, he lists the names of the 12 spies that go into the land. 
And we know that Joshua was one of the 12 spies that went in. He, him and Caleb were the two that brought back the good report of the land. They're the only two that end up getting to go into the promised land. But if you read that first listing of 12 names, Joshua's name is absent. And so we're just going to look at one verse, but Numbers 13, verse 18, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. That was one of the spies. And if you look down in verse 16, it says this, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land, the 12 names that we didn't read them all, but they were all listed there. And then he says, Moses gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. So Moses, at some point, changed Hoshea's name to Joshua. So he was once called Hoshea, now he's called Joshua. So in English, those look like almost the same. I mean, they don't look the same, but they both have six letters. You know, Hoshea, Joshua, like, you know, whatever. Like, what's the big deal? But in Hebrew, they're different in a very significant way. So in Hebrew, the word Hoshea means deliverer or salvation. Hoshea. And when he changed his name to Joshua, he changed his name to Yehoshea. See how it's different? It's not the same. So English, we go from Hoshea to Joshua. In Hebrew, we go from Hoshea to Yehoshea. And I just told you a minute ago, what does Ye mean in Hebrew? So he changes his name from deliverer or salvation to God is deliverer or God is salvation. And I think I know why Moses did it. This is my opinion, but I'm convinced that it's true. And you can make your own judgment after I tell you, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that it is. You see, Moses was supposed to take them into the land. That Moses thought he was going to the promised land. By the way, Moses' name, or Moshe in Hebrew, uh, means to draw out. And it's, it's kind of funny, um, I just I missed in my notes here, um, I had, when I was studying this and reading through some of the commentaries, um, when, when you read about how Moses changed um, Joshua's name from Hosea to Joshua, it just says, for, us, for some unspecified reason, well, I'm about to specify it for you. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 48 through 52 on that same day, the Lord told Moses, go up into the Abiram range to Mount Nebo in Moab across from Jericho and view Canaan. Go look at the promised land, the land that I am giving the Israelites as their own possession. There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die. And it's very, nothing, nothing more encouraging than climb, like, I think about that to be the last thing you do before you die is climb a mountain. Like, maybe come down a mountain, not climb the mountain. So he says, climb the mountain, look at the promised land, and then you're going to die and be gathered to your people just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore, you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land I am giving the people of Israel. So does everybody remember what happened at Meribah Kadesh? Anybody? Yeah, there we go. So God had told Moses to speak to the rock and that water would come out of the rock. The rock we know is Jesus. So he says, speak to the rock and water is going to come out of the rock. And Moses had been frustrated with the Israelites because being a pastor is hard, y'all. 
You got to deal with people. Just kidding, y'all are better than the Israelites were. So he takes his staff and he smacks the rock and the water comes out of it. And then immediately in Numbers chapter 20, verse 12, the Lord says, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. That's right after the story. So he he strikes the rock and the Lord immediately reprimands him and says, you're not going into the land. You didn't do what I told you to do. You don't get to go into the promised land. Now, I've had a lot of coming to Jesus meetings in my day, but I've never had one with Jesus. I was telling a story this week. I had this guy uh, in my previous career where I worked in, as a, in construction, I had this guy who was working for me and he wouldn't answer his phone. And I called him one day and I said, hey, how much am I paying you on this project? And it was a lot of money, like a quarter million dollars. And I was like, how much am I paying you? He was like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, well, I'll tell you. It's a quarter of a million dollars. So I just have one question for you. How much more do I need to pay you to get you to answer your phone when I call you? So I've I've been in some coming to Jesus meetings with some people over the years, but I've never been in one with Jesus. And, And I think that after that coming to Jesus meeting, that Moses had a coming to Jesus meeting with himself. He had let his emotions get in the way And so he took the guy who was going to be his successor, Hosea, and I I think he pulled him aside and said, I'm not going to let the same thing that happened to me happen to you. I let let myself get in the way. And so I'm going to change your name so that you never forget that God is first. And so he changed his name from Hosea to Yehoshea, so that every time someone said his name, every time he said his name, every time he thought about his name, he would be reminded that God was first. That's my opinion, but I think it's a good one. (laughs) And so each of these two Joshuas represent something about the New Testament Joshua, the New Testament Jesus. So in John chapter 1, verse 17 says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the law came through Moses, grace and truth come through Jesus. So they're, they're being contrasted here. This is, this is profound, really, I promise. Um, I had this teacher in college, his name, he had the coolest name ever, Elmer Towns was his name, um, he probably is dead now. He was old 20 years ago. like He was like in his 90s, I think. Um, but he wrote the textbook that we studied at Liberty. And he has this phrase that, is, uh, that I love. He says, there is simplicity in profundity, meaning that sometimes the, the most profound things are, are really, really simplistic. But I want you to catch this. Grace and truth come after the law. They don't coexist. The law cannot take you into the promised land. It can only lead you to Jesus. I see on social media all the time, there's whole channels on TikTok dedicated to this. And they ask the question, if God is love... How do you reconcile that with Old Testament angry God? And they have these really long, drawn out conversations about why they think that is and all of this, but it's really pretty simple. Grace and truth come after the law. I know it's not like little bunny foo-foo, but here's the entire thing. God made man... 
Man chose to unplug from God as the source, so God gave us the law so he could reestablish contact with boundaries and keep connected with us with the ultimate plan that one day he was going to send his son to become a baby, to become God as a human, so that he could grow up, do the thing that we could never do, and reestablish connection with God that didn't require the law. That's the whole point. They had been trying for thousands of years to keep the law, and ironically, we still are a lot of the time. We preach grace, but then we say, well, but this and but that and but this and but that. But the, the law and grace and truth, they can't coexist together. Paul says in Romans 6.14, For sin shall no longer be your master. In the New King James, that says, Sin shall not have dominion over you. Because you are not under the law, but under grace. Satan has dominion over this world. We know that because he said it to Jesus in Luke 4, and Jesus didn't tell him no. He just says, I have dominion over the world, and I can give you everything. And he says, don't test the Lord your God. Like He doesn't say, like, no, you don't. Like He says, yeah, you do, but don't put the Lord to the test. And Jesus came to establish and invite us into a new kingdom. Listen, the only power that sin has in this world is the power that we give it if we're believers. Salvation is submitting to the lordship of Jesus. And so the natural question that comes up when you talk about sin and grace is this, and and Paul answers it, people say, Well, if you preach grace, you're just giving license to sin. Well, I like to counter with something like this. Well, you're just trying to manipulate people under the guise of spiritual authority. Which one's worse? Trusting Jesus or trying to manipulate people to get what you want using the Bible as your way to get it done? I think that's way worse. Paul says in Romans 6.15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Some just say, heavens no. That's old King James, I think. Grace is actually higher than the law. These people who just... Sorry. So Jesus, <laughs> Jesus said... You've heard it say, don't commit adultery, but I say, don't even look at a woman lustfully. Jesus said, you've heard it said, do not murder. I say, don't even be angry. Jesus said, you've heard it say, an eye for an eye. I say, when someone smacks you, turn the other cheek. So people can get out of here with the license to sin nonsense. Because grace calls you to a higher standard. Grace, doesn't, grace is not a license to do whatever you want. Grace empowers us to live beyond what the law could never do. So back to Joshua. Did you all know that Joshua met Jesus one time? Like for real? Like he really did. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to... These guys in the Bible? (laughs) If I saw the commander of the Lord's army with his sword drawn, I'm probably going the other way. Um, So... (laughs) Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down in the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does thy Lord have for his servant? Does my Lord. I threw in a thy. There we go. I've been talking about the old King James too much this morning. Verse 15, the commander of the Lord's army replied, 
Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. What a response. So this, just get a picture in your mind of this. So the angel of the Lord, probably tall, um, with big sword, standing there, drawn. And Joshua comes up and says, are you for us or our enemies? And he says, neither. And then so Joshua hits, the, hits his face and he's like, oh, yeah, you're sorry. I, didn't, I didn't, didn't realize you were angel of the Lord. And then he says, since you're the angel of the Lord, what message do you have? And he says, take off your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy. So I want to stop on that question where he says, are you for us or for them for a second? And Jesus, the angel of the Lord, Jesus, just says, no, neither. I'll give you an example, but uh, in the opposite. I want to meet the person who was at a party one time, and they said, hey, we've got two options for dessert. We've got peach cobbler and vanilla ice cream. Which one do you want? And they just said, yes. Okay, so this is like that, but the opposite. He's got better self-control than we do. (laughs) Jesus says, I'm not for you or for them. I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to get you on my side. I'm here to take over. This verse is the very, the very end of chapter 5 in the book of Joshua, verse 13. The very next verse starts chapter 6 of Joshua, the book of Joshua, and that's the story of the fall of Jericho. So this is right before Joshua tells them we're going to do the thing, march around the wall seven days and shout and the walls are going to fall. Right before that, Jesus shows up and says, Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. The only way you're going to do this is if you get on my team. We don't have the context because of our culture, but in ancient Hebrew culture, and really in all ancient cultures, if you put your shoe, if you wore your shoe and set your shoe onto someone's property, it was a symbolic proclamation of ownership. That's why certain cultures, you take your shoes off when you walk into their home. That's why it's disrespectful in certain cultures to wear your shoes inside someone else's house, because you don't wear your shoes on ground you don't own. Removing your shoes is two things. One, it was a sign of, of submission, but it was also often a, a symbol of slavery. Slaves didn't own shoes. Listen, the only way to defeat the enemy in your life is not to try and get Jesus on your side. It's for you to submit to the Lord of the, the commander of the Lord's army, for you to take off your shoes in his presence and get on his side and let him win the battle. That's the only way you can do it. So, point one, he saves us from the dominion of sin. Point number two, he saves us from the guilt of sin. So, the second Joshua is the high priest when Israel is returning from captivity in Babylon. They have been there for 70 years, and he's, he's a type of Jesus. Uh, we're going to be in Zechariah chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 8, and then we're going to go back and read the first four verses. So Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Listen, high priest Joshua. I like that. That's how you know it's a different one. He calls him high priest Joshua. Listen, high priest Joshua. You and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come, I am going to bring my servant, the branch. Zechariah is quoting Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Jesse is the father of David. 
And from the line of David will come the branch. That's the, that's the prophecy in Isaiah that, that prophesies that Jesus is going to come through the line of David. And then in Luke chapter 2, verse 4, that's why Luke, when Luke is writing um, and convincing that Jesus is the Hebrew Messiah, he says, So Joseph went, uh, also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belong, belonged to the house and line of David. So Zechariah is prophesying to Joshua, to high priest Joshua, 500 years before Jesus' birth. And he says, you and your other priests are symbolic of the high priest, the branch. And the branch comes from the shoot, which is David, and the shoot comes from the stump, which is Jesse. Jesse. And 500 years later, a baby was laid in a manger in Bethlehem from the shoot of David, the stump of Jesse, the branch, Jesus. I don't know for sure, but I think that might make Jesus baby Groot. Maybe. (laughs) Just saying, you can make a case for it. That's in the Passion Translation, I think. All right, so Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right to accuse him, to accuse Joshua before the angel of the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. That's the only thing you should ever say to Satan, by the way. Um, The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. The New King James says that a little bit differently in verse 4. He says, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, See, I have removed your iniquity from you and will clothe you with rich robes. I've taken your iniquity off of you, and I'm going to clothe you with rich robes. Jesus shows up. He's the only one who can actually remove your iniquity. Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed, that word removed, our transgressions from us. Y'all know I absolutely hate, there's a phrase that I absolutely hate, I loathe, nope, don't like it, no, I don't. There's one phrase that I loathe entirely, and it is, some of y'all caught that, Um, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. So think about it. I'm a I'm a compulsive showerer. Um, Nathan, you can come if you can. Um, anytime I go somewhere, I take a shower right before I go. So a couple of months ago, we went to a marriage conference, and I had like stuff to do during the day. So I'd gotten up and showered in the morning, and then I thought I was like, "Do I want to shower before I go tonight?" And I did want to shower, but I was like, "Nah, I'll be all right." I'll be fine. I showered this morning. It's not like I hadn't showered in like days. I'd literally showered like eight hours before that. And I was like, no, I'm just going to go. And so I went. And all night long, like I just felt gross. I wasn't gross. I was probably fine. But I felt gross. I couldn't couldn't stand it. Some some of us, we think that that's how, that's what salvation is. We, We think that we're wearing, that we're filthy. We're wearing dirty clothes and that Jesus takes this magnificent robe and puts it on over our filthiness. That would still be amazing. That would still be awesome if that's what he did. If he took his robe and covered up our mess with it, that would still be enough. Our sin would be covered and we could have a relationship with God because when he looked at us, he would see the jacket and he wouldn't see all the junk going on underneath it. But that's not what this says. 
He doesn't just wrap us up in a clean robe. He removes the filthy clothes and then puts on new clothes. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've heard this. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, that's seeing... um, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just, because God is just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And then we read last week, Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. But now he has reconciled you meaning he's brought you back by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Both of these passages communicate a huge truth. And that truth is we've been declared not guilty. And here's what we do. And maybe it's just me, but see if you can identify with this. We say something like, God, I know you declared me not guilty, and that's awesome. It's awesome. But you and I, you know, we both know the real truth. We both know that really I'm guilty. You know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Anyone? When we do that, we're declaring that the Lord is unjust. We're calling him a liar. I know that's strong, but it's true. And that's why I get so frustrated with theology that focuses on the dead man. Jesus is alive, y'all. It's good news. He defeated sin, death, and the grave. But we want to hang out in our grave clothes. Say, God, I know know you declared me righteous. I know that you said that you took off the filthy rags and gave me new ones, but I I just don't see it. If God declares you not guilty, then you are not guilty. Just like he told Peter, don't you dare declare unclean what I've declared clean. And I'm telling you today that if you've submitted to the Lordship of Jesus, you've been declared clean. You've been declared not guilty. Don't you dare declare yourself unclean. So back to our high priest Joshua. Jesus took off his filthy clothes. Question, what do you do with them? When Jesus went to the cross, he put them on. 1 Peter 2.24, he bore our sins. Catch this. Joshua the high priest is symbolic of all of us today. Jesus took the filthy clothes off of Joshua the high priest. He put them on himself. He suffered, was beaten, was crucified. A criminal's death, the equivalent of the death penalty. The electric chair, if you're in Texas, I don't know if we do that anymore. Lethal injection nowadays. But he he was put to death through corporal capital punishment. And he was buried, wearing our filthy clothes. He was a real person who was really beaten to death. We talked about why that was important in the first message of this series. But on the third day, he got up. 
And when he got up, he took those filthy clothes and threw them away forever. And the only reason that we wear filthy clothes is because we choose to go pick them up and put them on. You ever thought about what Jesus is wearing now? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. I don't think he's wearing the filthy clothes anymore. Verse 14, the hair on his head was like wool as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Can you imagine just some, like he's holding stars in his hand. They're just... And coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Today, if Jesus is Lord, you're clean. You're not guilty. Jesus took off your filthy clothes, put them on himself, went to the cross and died and giving you new clothes. And that's the best gift any of us could ever ask for at Christmas. I want to close with this. I saw this um, quote this week from John Piper. And I don't agree with a lot of his theology, but I love John Piper. And he just, I'm just, I'm just going to read this to you and then, and then we'll pray. He said this, The incarnation is the preparation of nerve endings for the nails. This is what the incarnation is. The incarnation is the preparation of a brow for thorns to press through. He needed to have a broad back so there was a place for the whip. He needed to have feet so there was a place for the spikes. He needed to have a side so that there was a place for the sword to go in. He needed cheeks, fleshy cheeks, so that Judas would have a place to kiss and there would be a place for the spit to run down that the soldiers put on him. He needed a brain and a spinal column with no vinegar and no gall so that the exquisiteness of the pain could be fully felt for you and for me. And so he came. He had to come as a human so that he could die for us. As a baby, wrapped in strips of cloth and placed in a manger, Mary, Joseph, and a few others got to be there to welcome the king of the universe. Born in ordinary birth, but in an extraordinary way. Immaculately conceived, and they called him Jesus, the Messiah, Emmanuel. Jesus, anointed to be the prophet, priest, and king, God with us and God in us, the God who saves. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, like we do every week, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message today? Holy Spirit, help us fully understand this miracle of incarnation. Lord, we ask you to help us believe that when you said it's finished, you meant it. We ask you to help us believe that you were born into the world, the perfect, unblemished one, born to be our Messiah, Emmanuel, Yeshua, the God who saves. In Jesus' name, amen.